Welcome, or welcome back, I should say, if you were already with us this afternoon for the wonderful workshop led by Dawn Marie Bazemore and Phila Dankio earlier today. I'm Sophie Rosenfeld. I'm the project director for this series on choice here at the Wolf Humanities Center and a member of the history department at Penn. And this afternoon, I am delighted to announce that we're gonna be watching part of a new dance by Dawn Marie Bazemore entitled Oshun, after the Yoruba deity. It's going to be performed by a group of terrific dancers. Some of us also met earlier today from Philodenko, Clarissa Golden, Joe Gonzalez, Jamil Malik Hendricks, and Courtney Robinson. The performance is going to be followed by a conversation to be led by Dixon Lee, who's a doctoral candidate in English at Penn and also a dancer and poet. And I will introduce the rest of the participants in this conversation after the performance. But first, for the whole treat of today, I want to thank again a number of people. Among them, in addition to Dawn Marie herself, the dancers and our speakers, Gaynel Sherrod, Interim Executive Director of Philodenko, who got this collaboration off the ground many months ago, Kim Bear Bailey, current Artistic Director of the company, who's making this happen now, the Department of Africana Studies, the Center for Africana Studies, and especially the SACS Program for Arts Innovation here at Penn, and along with the terrific production crews at the Annenberg's Prince Theater and at the Wolf Humanities Center who are making this complex event happen. That's all from me for now. Now on to the performance. Thank you. This is not a small voice you hear. You hear? You hear? You hear? This is a large voice coming out of these cities. This is the voice of Latanya, Kadisha, Shaniqua. This is the voice of Antoine, Daryl, Shaquille, the voice of Will, Joe, Jamil, Victor, Elijah, the voices of Janine, Courtney, Clarissa, Dana, Michaela, running over waters, navigating the hallways of our schools, spilling out on the corners of our cities, and no epitaphs spill out of their river mouths. Well, son, I'll tell you. Life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tax in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor, bare. But all the time, I's been a-climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So, boy, don't you turn back. Don't you sit down on the steps cause you finds it's kinda hard. Don't you fall now, for I's still going, honey. I's still climbing, and life for me ain't been no crystal stair. <laughs> Thank you. 
The problem with Zoom is how hard it is to clap properly. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. That was very beautiful. And we now move on to a conversation about this work and about dance more generally, mentioned as led, as I mentioned before, by Dixon Lee. The discussants will be Dawn Marie Bazemore herself, the choreographer responsible for Oshun, a longtime former Philodanko Dance Company member and now assistant professor of dance at Rowan University. Jasmine Johnson, assistant professor of Africana studies here at Penn and an expert on West African dance, black feminism, diaspora, performance, a wide variety of things. And Deborah Thomas, our Jean Brownlee professor of anthropology and director of the Center for Experimental Ethnography also at Penn, author of many books and documentary films on topics ranging from globalization and race to embodiment and violence, and in an earlier moment, a dancer with the wonderful New York company, the Urban Bush Women. We're thrilled that they're all willing and able to join us tonight for this conversation. If you'd like to know more about any of the participants in tonight's events or about Philodanko, our website has more information. But now I'm going to turn things over to Dixon. Please put your questions into the question and answer. I believe we'll get to as many as we possibly can. And thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. I just wanted to first welcome everybody into this space that's adjacent to the very beautiful performance that we just saw. Um, my first question is actually to Professor Basemore, who I think will be joining us later. So um, why don't we start a little bit with talking amongst ourselves? So I know Professor Johnson and Professor Thomas Dance has been central to how you think about your scholarly life, but I know that both of you are also dancers yourselves. So I just wanted to start a little bit there and ask, when did you start dancing? Why did you start dancing? And more of a kind of um, abstract question is, how did dance first choose you as a body that moved with ideas and with histories in space? You wanna go first, Jasmine? Sure. Um, so thank you so much already. This is a really wide and, and capacious question. Um, you know, I think that dance has always been central to how um, my family has shown up in community and, and to each other. Um, very few events that didn't have some form of collective social moving. Um, and so I think that uh, even before I began to really think about kind of choreographic dance, concert dance, stage dance as being something incredibly generative, um, precious and robust, um, dance had always been a way that I was practicing family and practicing community. Um, I'll say that, you know, when I was beginning graduate school, I had, um, although I had always been dancing in some ways, ballet, tap, jazz, West African. Um, you know, I went back, when I went to graduate school, I went back to West African dance really as a way to stay a, a human being in a, in a context, a really intense intellectual context that can in many times feel very disembodied. Um, and it was through that practice of um, just working to be fully integrated um, that I kind of backed into um, an ethnographic project, which is, is, is now the basis of, of my, um, my manuscript. So in many ways, the research and the ethnography, because of the intensity of its embodied component, is what made me a professional dancer rather than the other way around. And I'm really grateful for that, for that kind of entrance, um, at least into a professional West African dance practice, because I had the kind of um, sensibility of knowing how important uh, that West African dance classes have been particularly to, to Black folks in the Bay Area and New York City, which is where my work is, um, but then also thinking about the kind of power of dance to be able to express um, in largely spaces where very few words are uttered, um, but where history is, is, is alive, right, um, and really loud if we're listening. So I'll just say that to, to open up um, to your question and, and maybe pass it to, to Dr. Thomas. Yeah, yeah thanks, um, Jasmine. I think um, 
like you, dance was uh, initially a family scenario um, on both sides of my family. And, you know, vivid memories of women dancing polka together at weddings on my mom's side of the family. And then my parents' parties where people were dancing reggae and other uh, popular music forms at the time. Um, but I also didn't start out as a dancer. I actually started out as a gymnast and I was a competitive gymnast for about a decade, even into college. And um, eventually I felt like I needed to experience something else. Um, and I quit the team and tagged along with a friend of mine to a jazz class and just like fell in love and just started taking every class I could find in any genre. I learned all kinds of dance during that time and then started to dance with particular choreographers. Um, and one thing led to another and uh, ultimately ended up dancing with urban bushwomen, but also had spent a year in Brazil working with dancers who were incorporating the traditional dance and music forms of condomble into modern dance and concert dance. Um, venues. So dance for me had always sort of been a way to enter communities and to begin a conversation and to develop a conversation um, over time. And it is also what eventually took me to graduate school um, to try to think through the ways um, artists and particularly dancers had been involved in broader political movements and the ways they understood their dance practice as being a political practice um, um, as well. So I think that's, um, so it's always been a way to move around and to, to be in dialogue and be in conversation with other people. I'm seeing that Professor Basemore and the dancers from Pildanco have just been brought into our little screen. Can they hear what I'm saying right now? Great, so we're just opening a little bit with a bit of an introduction. All of the dancers are kind of introducing themselves. Um, dancers here are the panelists. Also, you guys who just dance in that beautiful performance. And the opening question was just asking a little bit about when did you start dancing? Talking a little bit about why did you start dancing? And this more abstract question that I find to be the most interesting question to ask dancers, what else is going on when you're dancing? What else are you trying to invite into your life and invite into your practice when you choose to start moving and dance? I'll, I'll start. <laughs> um, so my name is Joe Gonzalez. Um, I started dancing at 13. Uh, my mom kind of really pushed me into it. Uh, so I actually grew up uh, as English is my second language and also having dyslexia. So dance for me was a, another form of communication. So that's why it was important for me to continue it. Um, uh, I, from there, I went to high school for the performing arts. I went to college at the Boston Conservatory. Two years after that, I, uh, I had an audition for Philodenko. And seven years later, here I am. Hi, I'm Courtney Robinson. I'm from Richmond, Virginia. Um, I started dancing when I was four. Uh, my aunt and my mother put me in it because they said I could not, never would stop dancing, <laughs> walking on my toes and such. Um, I went to Appomattox Regional Governor School to further my studies in dance. Um, I was going to venture into the realm of architecture for college, but at the last minute, I was like, this is not my path. Why am I gonna stop dancing? So I went to SUNY Purchase. Fortunately, that was amazing for me. Um, and right after that, I went to Philodenko and I've been here for almost nine years. Hi everybody, my name is Jamil Hendricks and um, 
I got started in dance basically because uh, dance was just always around me. I, I say all the time, I didn't find dance, dance found me. My mom, she was in an African dance company for about 15 years, and I have another cousin who was uh, in Kula Mele, which is Philadelphia's premier African dance company. So I just grew up always around dance, always being immersed in the environment of dance. And um, as I grew up, uh, I studied at local studios like Elio Dance Unlimited, going to buy dance center. I trained at the Rock School for Ballet. Uh, I went to the high school for creative and performing arts. From there, I went on to attend uh, Rutgers University and study at Mason Grove School of the Arts. And a few years later, uh, my mom actually convinced me to audition for Phil Adanko. And at the time, I had took off a year from dance. So I felt like, uh, I don't know. I don't really think I'm ready. I think, you know, there's going to be plenty of other guys that are, like, way more talented. But she told me to just step out on that leap of faith. And here I am going on my fifth season. So, yeah, dance has just always been around me. So that's, you know, how I got started. Hello, my name is Clarissa Golden. I'm from Sumter, South Carolina. Um, at the age of three, my mom put me into dance. Um, I wanted to be just like my big sister, so much love to you, Jamila, wherever you are. <laughs> um, I took it seriously in middle school and high school, but then in high school, my one of my coaches found me. Um, I started doing track and cross country, and then I um, ended up getting a full, full scholarship to FAMU. So I had to put dance to the side because track and cross country was paying for everything. So I went to school for that. And then it wasn't until I started um, picking up a ballet class with Dr. Gaynell Shiraz, so much love to you, uh, wherever you are in the country. Um, she was like, why don't you do summer intensives at Philodenko and Ailey? So she's the real reason why I am back in it today. Um, and then after my senior year, I was interning with Philodenko and I asked Ms. Kim. Um, she's now the artistic director of Philodenko. And um, I was like, I think I want to pursue this professionally now. And um, she spoke with the second company's artistic director, Donald. And I was in the second company. And then a couple, a few months later, um, JB came downstairs and was like, why don't you go upstairs and started apprenticing with the company. Then that happened in 2017. She finally gave me an official contract to be a part of the company, and here I am today. So that's my journey. I guess it's my turn. <laughs> uh, so my name is Dawn Marie Bazemore, and uh, I think I was three or four when I started dancing. My mom always says she just loved the arts, and so she wanted to put me in the arts. And I don't think I ever thought I was gonna do anything other than perform. Even at that age, I always knew. And I wanted to be like Janet Jackson. So I wanted to do, I wanted to sing and dance and act and all of that. And as I got older, dancing just took over. That was um, where I was, where the focus was going. And it just, it required so much training and time that after a while, training in voice and acting kind of fell to the side. And I just always felt led in that direction. I also am a graduate of SUNY Purchase. Uh, and uh, Courtney and I realized today we have similar paths and that we uh, moved to Philadelphia and joined Philadelphia right after graduation. Um, me a long time before her. <laughs> and then I, I danced with Philadelphia for about 10 years. And then I went on to get my master's degree from Hollins University. And Joan Myers Brown asked me right after that to come choreograph on the company. It was completely unexpected. That was a path I didn't plan on taking. I wouldn't have done it without her encouragement. I'm so glad that it happened. I've had the opportunity to um, explore dance from a completely different perspective, still with Philodenko, with this generation of dancers. And at the same time, continue teaching, which is another passion of mine. So as you guys said, I'm also on faculty at Rowan University in the Department of Theater and Dance. And currently, I am studying to get my uh, EDD in dance education at the Teachers College at Columbia University. Great. Thanks so much for sharing that, everyone. I wanted to turn us a little bit to that performance that we just saw. And I know that one of the really remarkable things is that the performance brings in a kind of um, citation and a conversation around certain types of lives or certain types of griefs that seem to not find epitaphs, that don't find enough enunciation in the world. 
And what I found so beautiful about that performance was it's not just a lament in the way that the dancers have their own gestural vocabularies that are expressing things. The dance and the words actually fill the space of lament with a lot of spaces of metamorphosis, of transformation, and of expression. And so this leads me to my other question, which is sort of what are the kinds of social contexts that dancing whenever we've done it responds to? And what are the other kinds of words that dance adds into a discourse that, you know, actual uttered words sometimes don't quite get to? Uh, well, I'll respond because I uh, choreographed that ballet. <laughs> uh, what you saw was actually an excerpt of a piece that has four sections. Um, and the idea of the work was to celebrate all of the many facets of womanhood. So uh, in the very beginning, we were uh, exploring the ideas of women as leaders. And then you saw, so you saw a bit of that. And then in the last section, that was a more intimate um, conversation between a mother and a son. Uh, I was saying to the dancers on Sunday when we were rehearsing that what is most important to me as both a dancer and a choreographer is storytelling and connecting to the community, the people who are viewing the work. And so in a previous piece that I had choreographed, a duet, I had presented that in a really small setting. We had maybe 10, dan 10 audience members there to watch. And we were in a studio, not even, you know, in a um, proscenium space. And one of the women began to cry. And she said to us, when we talked about the work afterwards, that she saw herself in the duet and that really matters to me that the work transcends movement that the audience connects to what they're seeing that they can see a bit of themselves and their own story inside the work it's really wonderful to go to a performance and be like oh those dancers are beautiful that's beautiful things they're doing beautiful things with their bodies i can't do that <laughs> and then to leave but there's something really magical and meaningful about an audience member saying, oh man, I'm connecting to the humanness, the humanness of what these dancers are doing. That has become more and more prevalent to me as I've grown as an artist and a choreographer, more than steps and technique, uh, just really feeling like I've connected with the audience on a very basic human level level so i try to impart that on the dancers and i think that they do a wonderful job of bringing that into the work yeah i think that's so beautiful the way that you're bringing in um how storytelling is one of these major techniques or practices that's also pulled into the practice of dance that animates dance as something more than the steps and I'm thinking here a little bit about how Professor Johnson has written about how tenderness floats inside the choreographies of Camille Brown how Professor, uh, Tom, uh, sorry, Professor Thomas has written about the way that witness is so important to how forms of art making are happening in the Caribbean. And so from the perspective of people who are studying dance in different modes, from people who are making dance and who are dancing themselves, I would love to have a few more words about what are the other kinds of techniques or the other kinds of practices in everyday life that are entering into the scene of dance to animate it as something that's more than just steps we see and go, oh, that's so beautiful, I can't do that. And then you just leave. Uh, some of the other practices and techniques in dance. So we have this thing, we have ballet, modern, and within modern there are Graham and Horton. But besides actual codified techniques and ways of movement, some other practices is research, um, experience. Um, self-reflective and relating to whatever concept you're dealing with. So that's a big practice so that we can be able to bring a character to the aesthetic of the work, to be able to uh, tell the story that we want to tell. Um, some other practices, um, there's just so many. It's not just movement and research. It's just how can I touch an audience member just by walking on stage. Yeah, and just to um, add on to what Joe said, I think that uh, 
unlike in the past, dance has become much more accessible, like, you know, through the advancement of technology. So now somebody who wasn't necessarily able to pay for dance classes back in the 80s or 90s, now you have YouTube where it's like a million and one instructors on different styles. And, um, you know, I always say that dance is a language in itself and all over the world we speak it differently. So I think dance really breaks that barrier of speaking what can't be spoken through words. So one of my favorite things to do when I'm just like, you know, trying to find new inspiration, I'll just, you know, I might just go out one night just to see, well, before COVID obviously, but to see like how, you know, what's the newest dance trend or like, you know, what style everybody's picking up on or what they're incorporating. Or I might just, you know, go through a rabbit hole on YouTube of just dance and dance history. So I think that the more accessible dance becomes, the more dance, the language of dance will evolve. So now, you know, instead of just having, oh, I do this style or I do that, you have a bunch of dancers now who are able to hop in these different pockets of choreography and stylistically. And I think that that's the most beautiful thing about dance is that as the world evolves, so does dance. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I can I can just say a tidbit. Um, just something to share over um, this past year with quarantine. Let me turn this down, sorry. Um, with COVID, I've been finding myself watching a lot of film, um, a lot of indie films and silent films, um, pulling inspiration from that and seeing how that makes me feel and move. Um, there's this amazing Netflix uh, show, I guess I can't say it, but um, another thing that I was drawn to during the time is a lot of color and how that made me feel some type of way as well and listening to different types of music. So not just like my regular like R&B or like hip hop, I'll switch it up with jazz and different types of jazz. Um, in conversations with my family and friends, that also sparks like different things as well. So something that Joe had said about experiences, things that you go through in life, um, I take from that the energy mostly from my family. Um, and one little thing that Don was saying with the multi, uh, women being multifaceted, the women in my family <laughs> being so strong, especially my grandmother, um, who... Yes, just, I, she loved me so deeply and the love that she gave me helps to, how can I say this? It, it just gives me strength to go through different um, things that we dance. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little emotional talking, thinking about her, I'm sorry, she just, passed not too long ago. Uh, those personal experiences in life really do help me. Also, the people who I dance with, taking from them and their lives and how their gifts help give to me and what we give to each other is very helpful um, when we're on stage and whatever piece that we do. Um, being in Philodenko, it's very versatile. <laughs> so your mind has to go in different directions, um, which is great because that builds us in our artistry. Um, yes. So all of these really beautiful personal perspectives and the kind of histories that people bring to dance are one of the things that I think is so beautiful about being able to be with the dance and more than just its brief moment. And the way that we programmed this event today is that there was an earlier participatory part of the performance where the dancers from Phil Danco led a workshop and I know that as a dancer, once I started dancing, I started watching performance very differently. I wasn't just watching with my eyes or with my ears anymore. I started watching with my body a little bit. And so I'm wondering, um, professors Johnson and Thomas, as people who are watching this performance, 
How do you think the way that your own dance life enters into your practice as a watcher shaped the stuff that was going on in this performance? I love that question. Well, I had the privilege of being at the workshop earlier today, um, which was so on time, I didn't even know. Um, it was just so beautiful. One, I'm amazed, you know, we talk about kind of how the virtual format, what it forecloses, but there's so much that it can give. And I was just really struck by how much of a community it felt like. One, immediately, um, you know, Dom just kind of set this kind of tone of, of, um, of just showing up and jumping to the movement, right? There, there was no sense of, um, studying the other person in the box, right? That like, it, it really only mattered in so far as we were all there together to be able to um, get in our bodies and, and to, I think, move collectively. So I say that because one, it, it was just incredible. So I wanna say thank you to all of you um, for, for leading that. And also two, they taught a little bit of the choreography that was in this. And so I felt like, um, um, I felt, like special charm to be able to um, have the opportunity to uh, really watch why, while we're calling, right? All of the things that I was feeling inside of that workshop, which was a lot of joy and also like a lot of rigor, a lot of rigor. And there was space for us all to inhabit it. Um, and even moments of a beautiful experimentation that I was also really grateful for. But one of the things that I felt while while watching that the excerpt was just like the the deep work that that kind of beauty and grace requires. Like even just thinking about that moment of that slow turn on Relevé, with this that that full three sixty, and it looks so effortless, and it is like full of rehearsal. I can only imagine. And and so those moments, I was one, appreciative of that embodied experience to be able to feel um, both an invitation into the choreography, but also how very far the choreography was from my own body because I'm not doing it like y'all are doing it. Um, but then also this kind of physical experience that I think um, allowed me to be a, a feeling to the simultaneity of, of just beauty and also deep rigor. Yeah, that was lovely. I unfortunately couldn't make it to the workshop as I was um, teaching. But um, yeah, I think especially now in this moment, almost a year into this kind of quarantine lockdown, tight spaces, um, tight spaces in the mind to a degree too, because you get so um, constricted, I think, worrying about everything that you're doing and everyone who you have to worry about, that it is just so lovely to um, watch and, yeah, imagine how that feels in the body right now. You know, imagine what the extension, that extension of the leg is and then the turn to the side or imagine the lift of um, the arm as, uh, as one moves in that other space. And um, it does sort of feel like a kind of vicarious, um, a vicarious uh, sort of embodied, participatory, collaborative practice of care. Um, and, you know, with the words and the relationships that the words really index as well, um, I did experience it as a kind of wrapping around. And I really appreciated that. Yeah, watching, um, I just felt something so strong when there was those moments of release in the upper arms, especially as people were coming down. There was the kinesthetic sense that I think uh, sometimes scholars of dance will talk about where just watching somebody else's movement lets you imagine what are they feeling when they're doing that? That's a way of empathizing or relating it to other people that's really unique to dance that maybe we don't get in words, maybe we don't get in visual mediums. And as I was feeling this moment of just elation, I remember also feeling a little bit of sorrow too, because I started missing dance classes. I started missing all of those moments of dance 
that seem to be um, disappearing and also transforming during the pandemic? So this is a question I'm so interested in hearing everybody's answer to, the dancers, the professors, um, is what have been moments in your dance life when you stopped dancing? Why did you stop dancing? And what brought you back to dance? What called you back in? I'll go. <laughs> um, I had babies. <laughs> And uh, I don't. I didn't plan to stop dancing. Uh, I danced with Philadelphia for ten years, and then I left to do theater. So I was able to go back to the singing and the acting. And then I got married, and life goes on. And I had a baby, and I thought, well, I don't want to um, leave dance. I was okay with not performing in the same capacity I had been performing it in the past. But I always loved dance. I wanted to still be involved in dance and I loved teaching. But I knew I didn't like to teach children. <laughs> and anybody who knows me knows that. <laughs> it takes a special set of skills to teach small people. And I don't have those skills. But when I was on tour with Philodanko, I would teach a lot of the master classes at universities. And I loved that. So I said, well, how can I teach at a university and support my family that was growing? So I went back to school. And that's why I got my master's degree. And I took my babies with me. And my mom, she came with me to watch the babies <laughs> while I had class. And, you know, it just came full circle. Like I said before, when I finished uh, my master's degree and I was invited back to Philodenko as a choreographer. And... Um, Again, that was just not what I envisioned for my life. And it was just such a beautiful, it was a perfect time. I had things I wanted to say and I wanted to express them quite differently than I had done when, as a performer. As a, you know, I want to say as a, I'm always a dancer, but as a performer in that capacity, it was time. It was time to explore um, a more sociopolitical approach to dance and dance performance for me. And that led to creating my own group and kind of branching out away from Philodenko a little bit and seeing how I could do that and self-produce my own work. So I just think it, it just keeps shifting and it's still shifting because I think what I do next, I will be performing in, not in this capacity, not like they do. <laughs> you know, I'll have more control over how I can present myself as a performer, um, but it'll be vastly different because now I am a wife and a mother of three children. You know, so I don't think it ever leaves us, you know, and I even watched Joe Myers Brown and, and, and Kim Bears Bailey, who's now the artistic director of Philodenko. When I joined Philodenko, she was still dancing. I danced next to Kim. So to watch even her transition in the company, but she's still in it, you know, so it just it's a beautiful thing. It's just a beautiful thing to watch how dance just keep, it just keeps reinventing you and reinventing itself. There's all kinds of ways to be. I always hear, remember hearing Joe Myers Brown say, I don't have dance, dance has me. And I think that, I don't know that I always understood that at first, but I, I'm starting to really grasp what she meant by that. Um, I, you know, I think most of us don't have ever a set date or age that we're like, we're going to just stop dancing right here and I'm done with it. I think, you know, if you get injured maybe or something happens, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to stop. It's just going to shift, as Dawn was saying. Um, you know, even when this pandemic started, I don't think anybody really stopped for maybe a day or two. Then we figured out we're going to dance online then. We're going we're gonna to make it work. So dance, we found a way to connect because dance to me is about connection and communication and we always have to have that, whether we have to figure out how to do it virtually, how to connect with the music, how to bring Courtney's experience and connect with each other and pass it on to the next person. We're gonna figure out a way to make it happen. Yeah, it's, it's the same as Joe is saying. I've never really stopped dancing. I mean, I did get injured, <laughs> but after that, it's you come back stronger but um yeah when we had to take a break because of COVID-19 um I was still in my living room teaching my little babies I'm a kindergarten teacher as well 
Um, so I was always trying to figure out something to teach them and keep them going at home. Same as me, keep me going in this. Um, and yeah, JB, Joan Myers Brown, she was always fighting to try to keep us together. So um, even though we were in our little tight boxes, we were still together on that screen trying to figure out a way to dance. Yeah, for um, for me personally, I think um, there, aside from COVID, obviously, uh, you know, kind of putting everything on pause before um, I joined Philodenko, I was dancing with Elion Dance Theater and I had stayed with the company for about a year and I was just ready for something new. I wanted, uh, you know, I started auditioning for things and, you know, things weren't just going to as the way I thought they should go or as planned. So I kind of took a year off from dance and being from an environment like Philadelphia, you know, there's not really much constructive things to do if you don't have something to do already. So, you know, I was kind of going on in a different path than, you know, I was traditionally raised on and, you know, just due to God's timing and, you know, my mom's conviction, she convinced me, you know, you should audition for Philodenko. Like for whatever reason, I think it was just, you know, m mother's intuition. She was just, I think this is going to be the opportunity for you. I think you should go. And I was like, ah, eh, I don't really know. But, you know, I went to the audition and it wasn't, I, I don't think I, you know, did my best. I did what I could do because like I said, I had took so much time off from dance at the time, but um, I'm just so thankful for just JB and her, ability to just have a vision for not only herself but other people as well i think that's something that you know people don't really speak on it's one thing to see your own potential but to tap in and see somebody else's you have to adopt a completely different mindset because prior to danko i didn't really have much of a relationship with jb but you know she told me i could come in apprentice with the company for a while take class and she just wanted to see like my level of dedication and that's when i kind of fell in love with dance again it, you know it, it just like you, you know, like they said, dance just, it, it really truly never leaves you. And it's been something that has honestly, you know, saved my life from a lot of other situations that like, you know, I probably wouldn't have made it out of if I didn't have something like dance to hold near and dear to my heart. So I think, you know, with the pandemic and everything, it's kind of another moment of just finding a new appreciation for something that you've always done. And, you know, just as we continue to grow, and learn about ourselves every day as humans. Every single day I'm learning something new about dance, whether it's from myself or from my coworkers or from, you know, somebody like who's amazing like, you know, Dawn and just being able to really just learn how to be present each moment and just make it count for what it's worth. So that's definitely something I've like learned throughout my two times of like having an extended period of time away from dance. Um, for myself, I've mentioned it a little bit earlier, um, a time that I was without dance would have to be when I was in college um, because of cross country and track. And thankfully, Dr. Gaynell Sherrod kind of redirected me whenever she could back into the path of dance. Um, but fast forwarding into the end of 2019 to 2020, and we were celebrating our 50th anniversary year, it was hectic. <laughs> we were <laughs> learning this piece. We were going on tour this place and then back in the studio for like two days to learn this whole piece in like two days. It was just a lot on the body and especially a lot up here for me personally. And we were actually in Germany. We were leaving for Germany this day last year. So we were there last year during this time. Yeah. And I just remember like just being so tired and then, you know, everything just kind of the, it hit the fan. <laughs> everything hit the fan and we were snatched out of Germany and we were back home in, in the States and we were all as a, you know, nationwide dealing with this together. And thankfully I'm in the community of dance like we all are and we really, picked everything up like we were offering free classes online we were teaching like it was it was amazing time during the pandemic for me like I learned so much from taking everyone else's classes online that I wouldn't have taken before like I was up 4 a.m taking class way out of Israel because why not it's free and I have the time to do it um 
yeah, I'm just so thankful for the community and for bringing that, um, the rest, um, the new ideas, the new inspiration, um, the love that we all have for one another. Um, it really replenished me. Um, I'm just so thankful for dance and this art form and all art forms and everyone is, yeah, um, one, I just want to just say this one word, one word that's been like, um, been on repeat during this time was community for me. Like everything kind of somehow centered back around community. And then after that is like conversation. So, yeah. I guess I'm probably more in um, Dawn's camp. Um, life happened in different ways. And um, when I decided to go back to school, I uh, I had to leave the company formally because we, at that point, were on the road about 35 weeks out of the year touring. And I would go back in the summers or during our extended breaks to work on specific pieces. And then eventually when I went um, back to Jamaica to do my research for a couple of years, I, I was out of that dance scene, but I was in the dance scene in Jamaica. and then. Um, eventually, you know, the, uh, the exigencies of life and trying to work and make enough money to finish school and all of that, just, I stopped for a while. And then when I got my first position, somebody I knew from the Limon company was teaching class. And so I was like, yay, you know, and so I went and it was just the wildest experience to, you know, when you're dancing full time in a company like you all are, you know, you're dancing at least six hours a day, sometimes more, and your body is habituated to a certain way of being in the world. And then to go into like twice a week, an hour and a half, you know, I felt like my brain was sending the signal to my leg of what to do and my leg was just not hearing it. And it just became very demoralizing in certain kinds of ways. And and then babies happened and, and, and you know, so my relationship to dance has, has changed and my relationship to creativity has changed. And um, as Dixon said, I've been doing more work in film um, and uh, trying to also coordinate different kinds of spaces on campus where people can come together and pursue their creative practice as part of their research and be supported in doing that. And I guess, you know, the last couple of years I've been sort of pulled back into dancing um, a little bit, obviously in very different ways from how it used to be um, before, but right now this semester, I'm teaching a team teaching a class with one of our visiting fellows, Reggie Wilson, who has the Reggie Wilson Fist and Heel Performance Group um, in New York. And it's been so much fun, you know, teaching with him. And we're the same moment in the New York sort of dance scene. So remembering all the people together and sort of being in those spaces again. And it's, it's making me feel like, wow, I'm really enjoying teaching this class with him. I probably actually really enjoy dancing for him, <laughs> um, you know, in a different moment at a different time. So I think, I think Dawn's right. You know, your relationship to the specifics of a dance practice changes over time, but the fact of dance never really leaves your body. Mm. Mm. That's so, that's so well put. I mean, I, I identify with much um, that, that has already been said. I, I think that the only moment I can really think of where there was a, it felt like a stop was only moments when my body stopped. Like when my body was like, okay, you, you actually can't keep um, this same pace, right? I remember like, you know, those West African dance conferences that are like, four days and folks would take four or five classes a day and you'd have all your wristbands and it would just be like this adrenaline um, moving, right? But then also the body's capacity to, to keep up with that pace. And, you know, when that kind of slowed down for a number of reasons, largely kind of relocation and, and travel, that um, once I tried to hop back into that space, my, my body immediately humbled. 
so, you know, there were moments where it was just like, I just actually can't, you know, my lower back can't take this. So I had to, of course, my mom was. <laughs> I want to talk about community. Um, so, you know, there were, there were moments where I had to really figure out like, okay, my love and appetite for dance is not the same as kind of being attentive to what my body is saying it's needing, right? And my spirit wanted to have that same kind of capacity, but my body wasn't able to. And so it just kind of transformed. It just kind of went into some other movement practices, right? Just trying to think about, okay, how can I use Pilates here to, you know, get a different kind of strength or a different kind of um, labor, but also rest. How to figure out how to have it, basically what everyone has said, a kind of different relationship to dance, right? And to trust, that it was okay for that relationship to change and not kind of, it's a moment I, where I was mourning, not being able to have that kind of stamina, right? Um, but just trying to learn how to have, um, a, to privilege a respect for my own body before, you know, letting the ego leak. So, you know, my body told me when to stop and then I had to figure out, listen, and figure out ways that I could have a healthy movement practice where dance could be central, but then where I needed all of these other movement forms to kind of keep myself in that. Thanks for all of um, the stories about dance. I really identify with the um, the way ego and spirit makes your body want to do things that the body just says, not today. Um, but I wanted to open our little conversation out into the audience now because it's closer to 6 p.m. And so I'm pulling up the questions that have come from the audience's uh, thoughts. So the first question I've got here is, Phila Danco joins dance to the name of our city and therefore also to love. Could you or anybody talk about the way um, you, and I think this is probably directed towards the Phila Danco dancers now that I'm reading it. Could the Phila Danco dancers or Don Marie Bozeman talk about how they understand these relationships between dance, love, and the city of Philadelphia? Um, I guess I'll speak on it. Uh, let me turn this down. But um, yeah, being a Philadelphia native, uh, growing up, you just always heard about Phila Danco, whether it was you know about a recital or their annual uh, winter and spring concerts. Phila Danco has always been a staple in the community. And um, I just think that Joan Myers Brown not only just represents something for the dancers in the city, but just for minorities in the city as well. Somebody who's created a legacy out of, um, you know, just being denied so many opportunities, you know, having so many doors shut in your face and just to have the goal and the courage to say, you know, I'm going to start my own thing. I'm going to start my own foundation, something that will last longer than me. I just, you know, I just only strive to do those things and affect my community in the way that she has as well, because there are so many people who don't even dance anymore who still come through Philodenko all the time and just, you know, whether it's to make a donation or enroll their kids in a class or just to, you know, come by and say hi and just check on how things are going. I think that Philodenko just represents um, just all the great things about Philadelphia, how you know, despite all the things that are wrong within our communities, how this one thing, dance in this one place brings us together. And I just hope to, like I said before, just to be able to take that legacy and build on it in my own type of way. So that's what I think of when I think of Phil Danko and this relationship to the city. Anybody else? Well, I'll, I'll say, <laughs> I'm a native New Yorker, and I usually lead with that. <laughs> I haven't lived in New York in over 20 years, but I don't hesitate to tell people I am from Brooklyn. But Philadelphia has been so good to me. I mean, from the moment I joined Philadenko, it felt like I had become a Philadelphian. And I have grown as an artist here. So Philadelphia has put its arms around me as a member of Philadenko, but also as a choreographer separate from Philadenko. I've had so much support from Joan Myers Brown, from Jean Ruddy, Dr. Brenda Dixon Gottschall. I mean, just immersing me into this rich arts community that I actually didn't even know was here when I was so focused on just being a dancer in my 20s. So I'm grateful 
So I do in my bio, I say I'm a Philadelphia based artist <laughs> who hails from Brooklyn, New York. But we put that in the last paragraph at the bottom. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I, I've i really grown to love Philadelphia and uh, really respect how Philadelphia, um, you know, lifts up its arts community. So. Thanks, Philly. Mm -hmm. Well, I was talking to Clarissa earlier about Philodenko being my second home. My whole family is in Virginia. Um, so when I came here, I had <laughs> nobody really, but it has become my home. It, and Joan Myers Brown has made that happen. Just like Don was saying, like embrace you with so much love and with open arms. Um, I really do appreciate that. And I'm very grateful for that. It's also the energy that Philly has, like it's, there's no words for it, but <laughs> like, I just remember like, you know, this small town girl from South Carolina just coming here and like, oh my gosh, like this, this, this moment of like, here I am trying to make things happen. I'm, ch I'm literally chasing my dreams and I've, I'm in it. I'm living it right now. You know, it's, I'm so thankful for Philly. I'm so thankful for Philodenko. So thankful for Joan Myers Brown and everyone that's contributed to where I am today. So shout outs to Philly. <laughs> um, so I'm originally from Boston, Massachusetts, and I didn't know anybody in Philadelphia. So, but when I moved out here, I did not feel alone at all because I received that love from my peers, my company, the company members, Philodenko. And from there, it's just been growing in the dance community. So yeah, love in Philodenko, that's, there you go. So our next question is, can you, and I'm guessing this could be anybody actually, can you talk a bit about the choreographic process I would love to know how um, you create this art and anybody's thoughts on the process behind everything. And then there's a follow-up question to this, which is that this audience member is also curious about choreography, including including what the term even means. Okay, me? I'll do. <laughs> uh, process. You know, when I actually st started choreographing at Philodenko when I was a member of the company, but it was just like playtime. Uh, we would just, you know, choreograph on each other. And I was just like, oh, I like this music. And I was listening to it and I envisioned these steps. And I call my friends and we live next door to each other. We come in and work on it. And then, um, you know, like we said, life happens. I became a wife and a mother. And then I, I remember specifically saying, if I ever choreograph professionally, it'll be because I have something really specific to say. And when Joe Myers Brown asked me to come choreograph on Philodenko, I knew I wanted to create a piece about the Central Park Five. I had this idea in my head after I'd watched the documentary, not the new film, but this was many years ago where there was just a documentary. But I grew up during that time. I watched that happen in real time. And I remember thinking, watching those young men on the news every night, man, they look like my friends that I go to school with, that I live, that I live with, my brother. So I knew then years later, having sons, because I have two sons, that if ever I had an opportunity to choreograph, this is what it would be about. And when Joe Myers Brown called me, I was like, I got it. And I came into the studio and it started with a conversation with the men. And I told them what my idea was, but we also had really honest conversations about their own experiences being black men in America. And they felt comfortable enough to talk to me about their personal experiences with law enforcement. Things that had happened to them, things that had happened to their brothers. And then we put that in the work. I would come in with phrases, and I said this earlier in the class, I'll come in with a phrase and we'll work through the phrase, and somebody will mess it up. And I'll be like, that is so much better than what I did. Everybody learned that. 
we're gonna do it just like that and that's really how we develop things um there's a section of the piece you saw earlier Oshun that's just the men's section and the music for that section um is um the message by Grandmaster Fash and the Furious Five we were rehearsing one Sunday we had movement and no music I said, I'm going to just put on this hip-hop playlist. It's like this old-school hip-hop playlist. And every time the men dance, they will, I think they remember this, I just played a different song. And then we got to that song, and I kept, we, just, we all just kept coming back to it. And I remember Joan Myers Brown coming to the door. I have it on video somewhere. She starts dancing. At the, I don't even think they knew because they were, they were moving. And she's dancing in the background, and I was like, this is the thing. So sometimes those decisions happen just like that. It's always, for me, collaboration. I could have a very specific idea, but it really depends on the bodies and the energy in the room. And I'm always willing to let it shift. Maybe what I thought it was isn't what it is. And it doesn't exist without them. The duet that uh, Jamil and Courtney do, that's about my mother and my brother. I don't know if I ever told them that. My mom is watching, I believe, so now she knows. That poem, that Lang that's Langston Hughes reciting his own poem, Mother to Son. And I grew up hearing my mother recite that poem. Just randomly, she would just say it was something she loved. But it's, I don't need them to think about my mother and my brother. So I told them that's where it starts. But certainly, as we see, Courtney's bringing her grandmother into that movement. She's embodying being a mother, but thinking about her own experiences. And so it's important for me to let those things happen. And when, that, when I learned to sit back and let it happen, I, we, we have had some emotional moments, me and these guys in the studio. You know? And the first section, I must say, uh, that is Dr. Brenda Dixon, Brenda Dixon Gottschold reciting a Sonia Sanchez poem. Another kind of random way we came to that was uh, Dr. BDG invited me to speak at the Black Dance Conference with her for her round table. She opened the discussion with that poem. After that, Joe Myers Brown said, I need a new piece, Don Marie. I said, okay. And I said, oh, let me ask Dr. BDG what that poem was. So I emailed her. She said, oh, that's by Sonia Sanchez, Philadelphia native. I said, you want to recite it live and be in the show? She said, for real? I said, yes. <laughs> and next thing you know, she was in the studio, which was like, the, I think that's like the most amazing day. <laughs> when she walked in because we had set the piece and also this is a piece for 10 dancers which we just made for four dancers on Sunday by the way there are 10 dancers actually in this piece and Dr. BDG walked in the studio and we were like oh it's about to be a whole thing it's about to happen and she got in there I wish I'm, I'm, I mean you gotta see it you just gotta see it she moves with them and through them and performs and it just took it all to another level but that wasn't me i just asked her to do it she came in and she was looking to me for direction i was like i don't know just you know move around that's great and what she did was wonderful sometimes i i feel like things come together when i kind of fall back as long as I have artists in this, and I mean artists, not just the dancers. Even when we were, you know, working with Mondo Morales on those costumes, Nick Colin on the lights. I don't know anything about lighting. Nick, this is what it is. And he would have these ideas. I mean, sometimes you just have to sit back and let the things fall into place. And the most beautiful things happen. That, that is my testimony, at least, as a choreographer. Okay, I'll go. Um, yeah, just to, uh, I think one word that um, Dawn just said that like really stuck out to me was collaboration. For me, when I think of um, just any type of process, whether it's learning choreography or choreographing myself, I just think of you know collaboration in the most deepest sense of the word. So it's, there are times where I might just you know take a drive just to see how people walk, how people talk, and that would just influence like how I may hit this count on the three or the four and just take it from there. Or um, like growing up, um, you know, my family said I, I never, I can never stop dancing. So we would have like little talent shows like for Christmas and Thanksgiving. And I somehow was always ended up making all my cousins dance with me and just like, you know, being like the designated leader. So just um, being able to like, 
just step in that she the, the shoes of being somebody who's like you know creating the actual work or uh, the vibe or whatever the energy is in the room. I just really base it off of who I'm in the room with or what I saw, you know, maybe a day or two before. There are some times where I'm not even inspired by necessarily other dance steps. Like I, I remember there was a duet that um, me and uh, Joe performed in Danko and Danko of about 2018. That was inspired by like the, um, life of Bruce Lee. It had nothing to do with dance, but it was just this one scene that just stuck out to me. I'm like, yo, that would be a great theme for this ballet I want to choreograph. So I think, you know, it's definitely different for each person. But when I think of just dance and, you know, just the process of itself, I think, you know, um, I think it was Alvin Ailey who said dance is for the people and should be by the people. So I always keep that in mind that when I choreograph or create something, I want to create that feeling of, you know, you may not remember one step that I did or that any of the dancers did, but I want you to remember that feeling of, you know, when they hit that grand plié or that bat mile or whatever it may be. I, it, the feeling is the most important thing for me in the process, you know, because we can always, a bat mile is a bat mile, a pirouette is a pirouette. That's, that's never going to change, but it's like, what do you do with that? So I think that for me, that's the most important uh, part of my process, just seeing how my work is going to make people feel. I want them to walk away feeling something. So, yeah. Yeah, f choreography is exploration. And so what I, I always say is choreography for me is the answer to any questions that I have. So if I have a question that allows me to look into that question, do the research behind it, um, or even if it's just something I'm observing, I, I actually did a solo about my brother who was recently injured, leaving him paralyzed. But he could move his upper body, so I was observing how he moves his body as much as he could, and I took movement and created a piece out of that. Because I wanted to know what it was like for him, so that answered that question for me. So that's what I like to use choreography as, to explore, to answer questions, and to further deepen myself and further deepen the community that is viewing the work and even ask questions for themselves. Um, I guess I'll answer as a dancer. <laughs> the process with working with Dawn. Um, I just remember before I met her and I was apprenticing with the company. Sorry, short story time real quick. Um, I was apprenticing and I was sitting at the front and they were doing movement for five. Um, I just remember how they just became the boys that were in the park. I was not watching a dance. I was watching it go down. <laughs> you know, it was, it just, it was the first piece that left me speechless, emotional, and like in tears. And I was like, I, I need to get in this piece. I need to meet this woman. Like, who is she? Who is she? And then she finally came in and we started working together. But working with Don is just, it's so easy, it's so, it's, she's so relatable. Like, um, I think, did she, uh, someone mention it, but just how she just came in, like for class, you mentioned it earlier, how she comes in and, all right, y'all, let's, let's get to it, this is the step. Um, it's, I lost my train of thought there. But working with Don is just, just amazing, it's just so easy, it's relatable. Um, her stories that you that she um, brings to the forefront, you find yourself lost in them. I remember when I first was, uh, we were doing Movement for Five on the road and going home and doing the research to dive even more into it. And even like with working with um, different choreographers, like we have to do the extra homework on this side to dive even more deeper into it, like another Philadelphian um, choreographer, Rennie Harris, he said is a piece on um, the move bomb bombing. And we all know what happened there. So you can literally go, what street is it? It's, it's in West Philly, it's, it's escaping my mind right now. But I literally drove down the street and I literally found the documentary and I watched it and I, you know, wrote about it, and then it was like another, I felt like another person. My approach was different then. Um, yeah, that's just a little bit of my process as a dancer. Yeah. I'm not a choreographer at all. 
I love being the canvas. And yes, Dawn is so open. And when she says she loves when we make mistakes, to see what naturally, organically happens, that's a really good feeling to just be free and open within the space and the process of being a dancer. Um, it's yes, that's 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 my story. <laughs> I love being that canvas. You know, sometimes you get choreographers who will just give you steps, and then you gotta go make something happen. But what's lovely about working with Don Marie is it's a creative, it's a collaborative process and a creative process, and that's always so much more richer and honest, honest for yourself and honest for the work. So it's always great to have that collaborative um, creation. So I think all these perspectives on what it means to viscerally feel the force of a dance, the way that choreography is really collaborative also brings up what that term actually means. It's from the Greek words choreo and grapheme. Grapheme means to write and choreo relates to the chorus or um, the orchestra space in theater. And so what that term actually means is about how do you write out a relationship between what's going on on stage and what people are seeing off stage. So that's a little bit of um, just extra stuff to kind of embellish all of the really great things that people have said so far. So I wanted to move on to our next question, which is I think directed towards the dancers. I wanted to ask you all about how you experience or live that very personal part of dance, the personal choices of movement, message, and emotion with the more collaborative exercise and maybe even more restrictive work with the choices of others, the choices of your choreographer and the choices of the other dancers. Um, you know, I literally practice even how I reach. I'll be in the mirror sometimes and I'll be like, no, you're not reaching for something. <laughs> Do it again. No, that's not right. Do it again. So just as something as small as that is practice and that's something I personally do that and that's with everything every movement how am I doing this pirouette why did, what does this mean why am I doing it so that's something I do to practice uh for me personally just not even even prior to my journey in Path and Danko one thing I always tried to do was I always learned by imitating so you know growing up I was always doing any type of Michael Jackson choreography around the house. My mom, you couldn't get me to sit down. So that just stuck with me even up until now in my professional career. There are some days where I'll literally be watching Joe, how he takes class. How does he, you know, take off into that pirouette from that fourth position or that fifth position? Or how does, you know, another one of my coworkers, how they, do they hit that arabesque line? And although it's going to be different on my body, I try to my best to embellish what they do and just make it fit for me. So I'm still finding my own voice, but not necessarily taking it the same way or the same approach that I would originally take it. So there are times where like, you know, Courtney is like one of my favorite dancers to watch ever. Like just how she just moves through things so effortlessly. I just, I'm always amazed by it. So there's always some type of quality from each of my coworkers or just whoever I'm around. I try to learn and soak it up and then apply it through my own voice and my own vessel. So that's just necessarily how like, you know, dance and the process kind of comes out through me. So, yeah. I just really hope that my kids are watching this because I feel like I talk about this all the time when I'm teaching them to when they go across the floor to really learn from one another and observe because you never you you sometimes we get so lost in our in our own heads where we just kind of forget to look outside of our little bubble and there's so much beauty in the world around us and we can pull from one another like that's just that's art you know like we're always pulling from one another, you know? It's not like, oh, this is what I have and I can't share it. It's about giving and sharing. We have nothing to prove and everything to share. So I hope my kids are watching. <laughs> I was thinking that as you were saying that, we say that before we go on stage with each other, we have nothing to prove and everything to share. And 
yes, um, being with these lovely dancers, taking from them, giving, taking, it's just that relationship that helps us. Um, but it's a process when you're doing different things, different pieces. Sometimes it takes me longer <laughs> to get to that point. Um, you have to sleep on it, <laughs> eat, thinking about it. <laughs> and if you're in the shower, like, yeah. wait a minute, how can I make this better and improve? And um, yeah, it's always a, a, a ongoing like challenge to make everything better because everything is not going to be the same. Your experiences and how you receive things and from different choreographers um, and different works. So the next question is to Clarissa. I hope I'm saying that name correctly. How did you decide to channel your athleticism from track to dance <laughs> and storytelling? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess um, the more surface level is my endurance. Using that to really get in my legs and trying to use my plie as much as possible and to get in the air on that. Um, what is, did you say? I'm sorry, can you read the question again? <laughs> Yeah, the question is, how did you decide to channel your athleticism from track to dance and storytelling? Okay. Yeah, so the first part is fine. Um, the, <laughs> the, the, story, the storytelling part, um, just like what we were talking about earlier, we, I have to really do my research. Um, I'm dancing next to some people that have been dancing since the age of two and all the way until um, they graduated college. So sometimes I do feel like I am a little behind, but then that's when I have to step in my head and say, girl, shake it off. Like, <laughs> you're okay, you are on time and you have arrived, period. You know, just keep doing the work and keep learning and keep growing and never settling. Um, yeah. I hope I answered that. But this is our second to last question because we're nearing 6.30, which is our end time. And this is a question that's directed at Professor Bozeman. As a choreographer, how do you decide when to invisibilize the labor and effort behind dance when it goes onto the stage? It's Bazemore. Wait, can you repeat that question again? Yeah. Um, as a choreographer, how do you decide when to invisibilize the labor and effort behind the dance when it enters the stage? Did you say invisibilize? Yeah, I think that's the question, invisibilize. Visibilize. Okay. Invisibilize. I wasn't sure if we were invis. Okay, we're making it go away. <laughs> that's what we're saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know that I, I give it much thought. There are moments where the dancers naturally make things look effortless. But I also, I don't mind seeing the work, right? I don't mind, there, there are, I definitely think there are moments where I'm like, no, that should look hard. This should look heavy, this should look hard. Um, it, it needs to look more weighted and grounded. And I think these are some really accomplished dancers, even if sometimes they don't think so. Um, and so definitely there's times I'm saying, this is looking too easy, guys. It's too pretty. It's too, you know. Um, I, I, I appreciate seeing the grunt work. And sometimes it's called for. And there are times where the work I'm building is just heavy, even emotionally. And it needs that. And then I think it, it becomes a little bit more relatable to the audience. I hope that's answering the question. I was trying to really understand what they were asking. Yeah, it seems like maybe that, I think that feels like a good answer to the question. Uh, how do you get the sort of labor of dance back on stage when sometimes things uh, look maybe a little bit too pretty or too ethereal? How do you get the body back onto the stage? 
So this last question is for Mr. Gonzalez. And the question is, where did you get your shirt? <laughs> uh, right at Philodenko, right in West Philly, 9 North Preston Street. And you can get it right there. <laughs> Straight out of Philodenko as well. There's many shirts, many merchandises. Great. So I just wanted to thank everybody for coming today, the dancers for dancing, um, the choreographer for sharing the work, and Professor Johnson and Professor Thompson for coming and offering their insights on dance to enrich this conversation. And thank you to everybody who tuned in. It's getting late in the night. I hope this is a way to kind of buoy your spirits in the middle of the week. And please join in later in the semester in the spring for the other Annenberg and um, Annenberg World Humanity Center events on our theme of choice. Thank you all.